This seemingly normal man is responsible for changing the gambling game forever. But how did the shy and nerdy math whiz become a billionaire gambler? Did he cheat the system? Or did he use his brains to come up with something else that tipped the odds in his favor? To understand how the man named Bill Benter became a billionaire, we need to go back to his early life, around 1977. Bill Benter always had a great fascination with numbers, studying them, testing them. It was all something that came second nature to him. With his sheer knowledge, he basically had a first class ticket to any job on the planet, but he wasn't interested in traditional work. He knew that he'd never be satisfied punching numbers in an office cubicle, but what choice did he have? Then one day, while browsing his university's library, Benter found the rest of his life between the pages of Beat the Dealer, one of the first books to ever document the math behind counting cards. This book wasn't published by a hardy gambler, but by a dorky mathematician not too dissimilar to Benter himself. It wasn't just proof that you can beat the house, it was proof that the house was being beaten by people just like him. And with that, Benter packed his things and hopped onto the next bus to Vegas, putting his entire life on hold to prove his new manuscript correct. During the day, Benter was slinging slushies at 7-Eleven at $3 an hour. At night, he'd hit the strip, running up budget casinos. At most, he was only making $40 a night, but the thrill of seeing mathematical principles play out at each table was priceless. And Benter wasn't alone in chasing these feelings. His sudden win streak attracted fellow card counters and casino security alike. In a sea of bad liquor and cigar smoke, these squeaky clean nerds stick out like a sore thumb. It was almost inevitable that he'd run into notorious card counter Alan Woods. Woods was an absolute beast on the table, turning $100 into $100,000 just like that. But he didn't approach Benter just to brag. He came here to make a deal. Woods managed to slew out other card counters based in Vegas and was looking to add Benter to their ranks. While Benter was extremely skilled at this point, the main reason Woods sought him out is that he showed extreme respect to the table. He was careful, and as casinos cracked down on card counting, it was better to have a few careful men than a dozen reckless cash cows. In just a few weeks, Benter was living the high life, sipping martinis and dining on steak, all the while beating the casino out of thousands. It was a gambler's dream come true. At this point, the idea of returning to college felt like a fuzzy memory. There was no need. Bill Benter was set. Though throughout his time on the casino floor, security was never too far behind. Benter's new gambling buddies would trace stories all the time, talking about what they do to you when they catch you. In one story, the guy got drudged and left out in the street. In the next, he was beaten to a bloody pulp. The thought of this happening to himself was never far from Benter's mind, and one day while hitting the Maxim one, a firm hand would grab onto his shoulder and ring out those dreaded words, come with me. Benter was taken into a back room and interrogated for hours. Alan's crew had been busted, and thus, their faces were forever plastered into the Black Book. The Black Book is a database of infamous cheats and card counters that every casino on the Strip uses as a blacklist, barring any near dowel from playing in Vegas ever again. They needed to find a new game, and fast. Luckily, Woods knew just where to look. In Hong Kong, betting on horses was a sort of religion. Despite their substantially smaller population, Hong Kongers bet more on horses than even the entirety of the United States, grossing over $10 billion wagered at its peak. It was an untapped gold mine. There was one small problem, though. The Hong Kong Jockey Club demanded a 17% cut of all winnings. Benter needed an edge over the club in order to break even. He needed to overcome gambler's ruin. Gambler's Ruin is a statistics problem that proves going against an opponent with a near-infinite bankroll while you yourself have a limited hand, guarantee with enough time that you will go broke. He wasn't even sure if beating the house was possible, but he had to try. Benter pilfered through every book on horse betting he could find, filtering out all the ones refusing to show their work, till finally he found a paper written by yet another mathematician like himself. And it was nothing to sneeze at. The paper went through every variable, every outcome. But how far could you get with theory alone? He needed data. Little did he know that he was sitting on the records of thousands of horses while at the jockey club. This would be his first jackpot. But putting the stats of every horse who'd ever raced on these tracks was gonna take some time. After nine months, his model was finally operational. 
though at first this computer only spat out nonsense predictions. It was almost completely useless if it wasn't for Benter's now encyclopedic knowledge of Hong Kong horse racing. With a few tweaks here, it was better than chance. Despite Benter continuing to tweak the algorithm, they'd still lose over $150,000 in their first year of operation. There had to be something he was missing. He tried plugging in every factor he could think of, but unfortunately, both Woods and Benter's wells had run dry. In order to continue their scheme, they needed to recollect their bankroll. Benter flew back to the States, begging for a loan to no avail, while Woods was winning back his losses in South Korean casinos. When they met up again, the dynamic had shifted. While Benter put in all of the work, it was Woods who held all the car. With his new advantage, Woods renegotiated their partnership from 50-50 to a 90-10 split, a complete slap in the face to Benter. He couldn't afford to let Woods disrespect him more than he had already had, and by the end of the decade, their long partnership had come to an end. Benter knew the both of them would keep betting on horses till the sun exploded, so in his last slight against Woods, he programmed in a self-destruct timer. It wasn't anything Woods couldn't have fixed on his own, but that slight annoyance would buy Benter enough time to get himself on his feet. Benter flew back to the States, determined to finish what he had started, and he was going to need all of the help he could get. In the meantime, Benter managed yet another card-counting ring seemingly learning a thing or two from his old mentor. During the day, he was nose deep in probability theory, and at night, he was hustling the biggest casinos on the strip. Benter was slowly building back his bankroll thanks to his new crew, but he was still having trouble staying on top of Gambler's Ruin. His model worked well enough, but there was still something missing. Then suddenly, it clicked. In hindsight, it was kind of obvious, but he had failed to consider where the Hong Kong public was actually putting their money. Unlike Vegas gambling, where the odds are set in advance by the house, Hong Kong horse racing uses a Perry Mutel system that sways the odds depending on how bettors are betting. With this new revelation, Benter could work backwards from the public odds to closer determine the outcome of the race. If the public odds were 1 in 3, Benter could re-examine them with his new model to reveal their true odds to be one and two or three and four. He had finally found his edge over the house, and with $100,000 in his back pocket, it was time to put his theory where his mouth was. Back in Hong Kong, Benter was eager to see his years of work finally pay off. It was his baby, and it required around-the-clock attention. If he wanted to get any farther, he was going to need to hire some help. And that's exactly what he did. Benter's Hong Kong apartment was now host to a whole cast of characters. Gamblers, journalists, analysts, coders, mathematicians, translators. It was an all-hands-on-deck sort of deal, with everyone doing their part, and then some. This rotating skeleton crew kept Benter on his toes, and their unique insights led him to the strangest breakthroughs. It was simple things that someone focused on math alone could easily overlook. And with their combined efforts, Benter and his small army earned over $3 million. At this point, it was basically its own mini company. Then out of the blue, a phone call came into Benter's office. It was the Hong Kong Jockey Club, and the card counter in Benter was panicking. The house called him in his own house over a million dollar winning streak? His past experience in Vegas told him this must be bad news. Facing his fears, Benter picked up the line, and what he heard next shocked him to his core. You are one of our best customers. What can we do to help you? Benter could finally let out a sigh of relief. It seemed like it was often Benter would forget that he was in a completely new part of the world. What gets you a black eye in the States apparently gets you a congratulatory phone call here. The difference between Las Vegas and Hong Kong was like night and day to him. All Benter asked for was a new computer, and just like that, it was done. The Hong Kong Jockey Club specially delivered a brand new machine that connected directly to the club's main computers. Before, Benter hired someone to place each individual bet manually, but now it was possible to place thousands at just the push of a button. After record win after record win, they found that their new system was a bit too successful. The Hong Kong Jockey Club then revoked Benter's barely won privileges. The club worried that if the Hong Kong public found out that they were getting every week by a foreign algorithm that most Hong Kong bettors would just quit, being an overall loss for the HKJC. Now they couldn't even phone in their bets. If Benter and his team were going to dominate like before, they'd need a new plan of action. 
they were then face to face with a grim reality. They were now going to have to manually input all of their bets. From then on, Benter printed out hundreds of betting tickets, filling them out with data from the computer and booked it downstairs to the corner store, where he'd submit them one at a time until betting closed. It was grueling, but it was paying off. Thanks to their tight turnaround, they were well on track with their previous pace. The Hong Kong government would not take this workaround lightly. However, similar operations to Benter's were being shut down left and right. It was only a matter of time before he was next on the chopping block. Eh, it wasn't like the money interested him anymore anyways. He had way more than he'd ever know what to do with, and he was the more giving away type anyways. If he was going to go out, it had to be over the top. It had to be spectacular and he knew just the way to pull it off. Binter had been purposely dodging any major prizes to avoid the wrath of the jockey club, but if it was going to be his last, he wanted it to count. He was now gunning for the triple trio. It required the better to predict the top three horses in any order in three different races. The average person had a one in 10 million chance to guess it, but for Binter, it was basically a guaranteed victory. When the whistle was called, Benter had won the jackpot, a grand total of $13 million that finally pushed him into the billionaire club. But instead of collecting the money, he let it sit in the Hong Kong Jockey Club, as unclaimed winnings would eventually be donated to charity. As far as Benter was concerned, he had more than proven himself. While all the money was a nice bonus, he was far more interested in solving a problem many said was impossible. Not only did he game horse racing, he completely demolished it. Binter became the stuff of urban legends. Some Hong Kongers say that the winner of the jackpot saw his ticket and died from shock, but Binter knew the real story and he couldn't be more satisfied. After his win, Binter retreated from the public eye. He had always been a private person, and his win only gave him more incentive to keep everything on the down low. Alan Woods never believed that Binter won that jackpot, and the two of them never spoke again, all the way up till the former's death in 2008 seemingly still bitter over their messy partnership. The Hong Kong Jockey Club lifted the ban on phone betting after Benter's big win, while still to this day, they refused to admit he was the winner. Later, they incorporated an algorithm much like Benter's to give out public odds, leveling the playing field for everyone. Benter's innovation revolutionized modern computing as we know it, but you'd never guess that from the way he looks. He still goes on about his life as usual, using his experiences in Hong Kong to teach classes on probability. Despite how much he'd object, his name deserves to be written down in the biggest history books as one of the greatest gamblers of all time.